Welcome to the October 1st, 2024 Northampton City Council meeting. Uh, I'm Alex Jarrett, as City Council President. I'll be presiding this evening along with Vice President Rachel Maori. This meeting and all participating on in person and on Zoom will be audio and video recorded. The meeting can also be watched on Comcast Channel 15 or by streaming on Northampton Open Media's YouTube channel. I now call the City Council to order. Could you take the roll, please? Sure. I'll quickly make Councillor Labarge a co-host. Let's see. Um, Councillor Dobbs. Here. Councillor Elkins. Here. Councillor Jarrett. Here. Councillor Clemmer. Here. Councillor Labarge. Uh, Here. Great. Oh, good job. Did miss it, but you. Mm. Councillor Maori. Here. Councillor Moulton. Here. Councillor Perry. Here. And Councillor Rothenberg. Here. Council President, you have a quorum. Thank you. So tonight's highlights include, uh, we'll be considering the appointment of Police Chief John Cartledge, uh, an order to reprogram hotel bridge funds for sidewalk repair, ordinances re related to parking behind 33 King Street and housekeeping changes to zoning, and three resolutions, a resolution declaring Northampton a sanctuary city for transgender and gender diverse people, resolution in support of equitable public school funding for every child, and a resolution in support of state ballot question four. I have announcement of two public hearings. Um, public hearing on 24.139 National Grid Poll Petition for Front Street, Per Mass General Law, Chapter 166, Section 22, the Northampton City Council will hold a public hearing on Thursday, October 17th, 2024, 6.30 p.m. in Council Chambers, 212 Main Street, Northampton, on National Grid's petition to install one singly owned pole on Front Street, approximately 115 feet west of the center line of the intersection of Valone Drive to support service upgrade for number, 40, number 58 Front Street. Um, and instructions uh, for accessing the hearing remotely may be found on the October 17th City Council agenda. We will hear all persons who wish to be heard thereon. We also have announcement of public hearing on 24.140, Comcast's petition for new service at 15 Gothic Street. That will also be on Thursday, October 17th, 6.35 p.m., same location. It's a petition to install new service to 15 Gothic Street. And uh, that's all the announcements. So that brings us next to public comment. If you wish to make a public comment, please sign up on the sheet at the podium. Um, if you're on Zoom, you'll use the raise hand feature, and the raise hand feature is in the bottom menu bar. And no one calling in by phone. Okay, if you're having trouble raising your virtual hand, you can turn on your video and physically raise your hand. If you want to submit a written public comment, you can email it to citycouncil at northamptonma.gov. It will be sent to all councilors and will be part of the public record. I'm going to alternate between people in the room and people on Zoom. Before you begin, please state your name and your city or town for the public record. To ensure everyone has an equal opportunity to speak, the council limits comments to a maximum of two minutes. After two minutes, I or another counselor will ask you to please finish your sentence. <coughs> so we do not respond during public comment. It is your time to speak. Uh, <clears throat> we also, our rules also state counselors and members of the public shall conduct themselves with civility and respect at all times. Your protected speech is a constitutional right and one that we ask you to wield with consideration and respect for all and with recognition that the public space that grants you that freedom is shared equally by everyone. You may speak on any topic. It doesn't need to be an item on the agenda. All comments are to be directed to the council. First person is Candace. Come on up. And is the uh, microphone green? Okay. Sure. Great. Thanks. And your name and city or town, please. Yes. My good evening. My name is Candace Burke. I'm at, in Northampton, Massachusetts. I stand this evening in support of Resolution 24.146, declaring Northampton a sanctuary city for transgender and diverse people. I would like to thank Councilors Clemmer and Maori for bringing forth this resolution, and also my counselor, um, Marianne Labarge, for speaking so passionately in favor of it. 
If you intend to vote in favor of this resolution, I thank you. If you're disinclined to vote for this resolution, I ask you to reconsider. I'm the proud grandmother of three extraordinary, of course, <laughs> grandchildren. One of my grandchildren is transgender. As you know, by reading this well-researched and well-stated resolution, the rights of transgender people are in profound danger all over the country. Without the passage of this resolution, my 13-year-old grandchild, who identifies as transgender, is in danger of having less access to needed health care and fewer rights to grow and thrive and be their complete self than I have as their 80-year-old grandmother. That members of the generation who are literally the future of our city would be less safe, have less access, and less possibility for a full life than those of us whose time on the planet is limited, I think is an outrage. I ask that you vote to support transgender protections and rights and continue to place Northampton in a position of understanding and wisdom and leadership in the fight for justice for all of our transgender citizens. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Bill Muller. Welcome. Your name and city or town, please. Bill Owen, and I live in East Hampton, Massachusetts. Thank you very much for these few minutes. Um, I've worked for the second largest police department in the state for 20 years, and I've met many supervisors and many chiefs in that, in that time frame. Um, I've known uh, Chief Cartledge approximately two years. Um, he's the greatest man that you guys could have picked for this job um, because of his integrity and his bravery and his professionalism. So pretty much all I'd like to say is just to, that he is, he is the right man for the job. Thank, Thank you. you. Peter Kekos. <coughs> Good evening, uh, Alex, uh, council people. I want to first of all thank you for the hard work that you put in day in, day out for the betterment of Northampton. Peter Kakos, Florence, uh, Massachusetts, Ward 4. I'm here on behalf of uh, the Leahy Fast for Palestine and uh, want to update you. Uh, having, uh, first of all, thank you for the resolution that we passed in f late February, and, but now the situation has become even more dire. And uh, there'll be others tonight who will speak to the actual resolution, which uh, uh, Jeremy has um, agreed to sponsor. Ralph Nader, longtime champion of consumer rights, in a September 10 report on Democracy Now! stated his firm belief about the true numbers of deaths in decimated Gaza since October 7th, no less than seven times the official account, a staggering 300,000. <clears throat> Moreover, at this rate, he predicts that by the end of 2024, one million, by the end of 2024, one million will have perished. How can we remain silent and thereby complicit <coughs> How can we remain silent and thereby complicit over Israel's 21st century iteration of the final solution? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer Scarla. <coughs> Welcome. You're Hi. in the city or town, please. Thank you. Jennifer Scarlett, um, Northampton resident. Thank you for allowing me to speak, and thank you, uh, as Peter said, for all your hard work. Um, I just want to say I'm very much in favor of the resolution uh, on trans rights in Northampton, um, and I'm sure that's a no-brainer for you all. Um, my uh, colleague, Nick Modern, will read the resolution to you that we're proposing that you all adopt. It's simply follows up on language that you 
very happily already approved on February 27th last year, um, calling on an end to U.S. military shipments to Israel. In the time since then, as you all know, um, things have gotten worse and worse for the Palestinian people. Um, and as you know, Israel has now put ground troops into Lebanon and is attacking other Arab nations around it. The suffering um, in Gaza in particular, but now the West Bank as well, and Lebanon is indescribable. Um, so we really need, uh, given that you know Israel is at this point, I'm sorry to say, nothing short of a rogue nation. Um, and our own nation is the same because we are enabling um, what is happening. Um, we really need every single elected official in this country to call immediately for a permanent arms embargo. And we need for you all to send that message up the chain of command to our senators and our, you know, Congress people. So, um, yeah, I just beg you to sort of reiterate what you already did in the resolution on February 27th in calling for an end to U.S. military shipments to Israel. It's the, the, the most immediate thing we could do to achieve a ceasefire and alleviate the suffering in Gaza. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Nick Mottern. Yes, hi, good evening. Um, my name is Nick Mottern. I live at 16 Strong Avenue, Northampton. Um, I'm a member of the uh, Leahy Fast for Palestine Committee, and I'm also on the National Board of Directors of uh, Veterans for Peace. And I'll read through this. I'll try not to read it too fast, but I do know there's a time limit. The title is Arms Embargo Resolution for the City Council of the City of Northampton. One, whereas on February 27th, 2024, the City Council of the City of Northampton approved a resolution calling for a ceasefire in, in Gaza. That includes a call for a halt to sending U.S. military supplies to the government of Israel. Quote, suspension of unrestricted military aid from the United States. Two, whereas the flow of U.S. weapons to the government of Israel is continuing and has enabled, one, genocidal attacks against the Palestinian people in Gaza, the West Bank, and East Jerusalem, resulting in untold numbers of civilian deaths, which the Lancet Medical Journal estimates may exceed 186,000 people. Two, the illegal widespread assault against the Lebanese people and the Israeli invasion of Lebanon, all of which threatened to lead to a Middle East and possibly global war. Three, whereas U.S. Senator Bernie Sanders has introduced joint resolutions of disapproval in Congress to block the sale of more than $20 billion in offensive U.S. weaponry to Israel, and four, whereas the continued shipment of U.S. weapons to Israel violates the Leahy Law, the Foreign Assistance Act of 1961, and the Arms Export Control Act. Therefore, be it resolved that the Northampton City Council urges Senators Edward Markey, Elizabeth Warren, and Congressman Jim McGovern to, one, support and work for approval of Senator Sanders' above noted legislation and to introduce legislation to impose a total and immediate embargo on the shipment of U.S. weapons to Israel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next is John Meehan. I guess someone has to be the token pariah tonight. Um, I've always considered myself open-minded. I'm world-traveled. I'm college-educated. I'm a Are your name or city or, and city or jo town? John Meehan, Northampton, Mass. Thank you. Fellow Northamptoners, I'm here today to ask you to reconsider your resolution and amend and possibly rewrite it, not on the basis of access. I have many friends of all stripes and all 
roads in life. And in Northampton, we don't need to be told that we have to welcome a certain crowd because we've transcended that. We value people by their personal values and by their soul. And if they afford respect, they get respect. We, we're open to discussion of ideas. And if they don't afford respect, they're considered bad company, myself included. I certainly have a lot of flaws. Um, society has set benchmarks on who is an adult for good reasons. An adult is consider considered to have reached critical mass in terms of his <coughs> development and is capable, afforded the sovereignty, of making his own decisions uh, based upon that he's either his own victim or his own success. In terms of adolescence, adolescents are continually growing. That's why they're considered minors. They're constantly being bombarded with different influences. They're growing emotionally, physically, sexually, psych psychologically, um, intellectually, spiritually. And there's sadly been instances where there have certainly, it's not me to call whether someone assumes themselves to be a success, that's their business. But there have been instances where people have gotten rash advice from people and um, that, that's time if you could finish your sentence and have made decisions that they later wanted to grow into and reverse and been unable to and don't take the value of parenting the state should not take the value of parenting in navigating what's considered to be the goodwill and safety of the people that by common law and common sense have been afforded. Thank you. Um, is there, has anyone else signed up at the podium? No. Check. No. Would anyone else like to speak? Okay. We will close public comment and move to thank you all. Uh, announcements from councilors and the mayor. Mayor Shara. Good evening, councilors. Uh, first, I want to announce that the Northampton Climate Emergency Coalition is having an event on this Sunday, October 6th. Um, it's at the Elks Club Pavilion, uh, outside in the pavilion, rain or shine, um, and that's at 17 Spring Street from 3.30 to 5. The coalition is inviting residents to meet with Dr. Uh, Director Dr. Ben Weil and the Climate Action and Project Administration team to talk about CAPA and the mission of the department and ask questions. Um, and I believe there'll be apple cider and gingerbread as well. Um, so uh, everyone should come out and learn about CAPA, and um, I will also be there, and happy to see anyone who's coming. Um, I also would want to announce, um, assuming appointed Chief Cartledge is confirmed this evening, there will be a swearing-in ceremony next Wednesday, October 9th at 6 p.m. at the Northampton Senior Center that everyone is invited to attend. Um, Council Rothenberg, I understand that you took issue with an event being scheduled before a confirmation vote, so I briefly uh, want to address the timing. Um, of course, to plan an event takes coordination, takes collaboration, takes time, while canceling one just requires informing people. So um, it's scheduled for a week after the vote tonight in case any changes uh, would have to be needed, and we did wait until a positive recommendation from city services to the full council. So the goal is to get a permanent chief sworn in as soon as possible for the department, um, and it's a really big moment, and people have excitedly been asking about the ceremony. So we wanted to give those interested, um, including counselors, uh, a little advance notice as to when the swearing in would be. But of course, like with the announcement um, of the appointment, it's contingent upon confirmation. So pending confirmation this evening, John Cartledge will be sworn, as, uh, sworn in as the chief of the Northampton Police Department next Wednesday, October 9th at 6 p.m. at the Northampton Senior Center, and all are welcome to attend. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Clemmer. Um, uh, mayor, the mayor. Oh, you're, uh, Mike. Uh, the mayor made my announcement, so I'm good. <laughs> Other announcements from counselors? Okay, seeing none, we will, oh, 
Councillor Lavarge. Yes, thank you. Um, just wondering, um, Councillor Jarrett, if you have the paper on the Pulaski Day Parade, which, com which is coming Monday, October 14, 2024, on Pulaski Day. October is designated as Polish Heritage Month, a national celebration of Polish history, culture, and pride. The event celebrating is sponsored by the Polish Heritage Committee. The day begins with a memorial mass, mass at St. Valentine's PNC Church, 127 King Street, Northampton. At 10 a.m., followed by the parade starting at 11.30 a.m., which proceeds through downtown Northampton, humanating the Pulaski Park. The program at the park is the late General Kashmir Pulaski, father of the American Calvary. So, and I do know mostly all of us councilors have marched in that parade, and it's really a beautiful parade. So I thought I would just bring this forth because I wasn't sure, Councilor Jarrett, if you had the paper on when that was going to happen. Thank you. No, I had not received that, so thank you so much for making that announcement. Are there any other announcements from councilors? Okay, we will move on to the consent agenda. I'm going to read the consent agenda and ask if any there are any items for removal. Uh, if there are, then we can debate those and we'll take a vote on those separately. Um, we do not have the minutes of September 19th. 24.128, appointments to various committees, positive recommendation by city services um, on September 23rd, to the Zoning Board of Appeals, Aaron Irvin, to fill a vacancy. 24.136, appointment of John Cartledge as police chief, a positive recommendation by city services on September 23rd. 24.138, an order to suspend parking fees on certain days in second reading. 24.141, an order to appropriate fiscal year 2025 CPA funds for community preservation purposes in second reading. 24.142, an order to authorize payment of prior year invoices, second reading. 24.143, an order to authorize fire department gift fund expenditures for smoke detectors and lock boxes, second reading. 24.144, an order to authorize fire department gift fund expenditure for a refrigerator, second reading. 24.151, an application for secondhand dealer license, Deep Thoughts Record Shop. 24.154, uh, appointments to the Conservation Commission and the Housing Partnership. These are for referral to city services. To the Conservation Commission, Richard Meyer, 516 North Farms Road, filling the term of Jennifer Smith. And to the Housing Partnership, Chris Palames, 659 Park Hill Road, to fill a vacancy. Are there any removals? Councilor Mayori. Uh, 24.136. Appointment, Appointment of John Cartledge. Any others? Okay, seeing none, I would entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda with that item removed. Move to approve. Oh, I second. Uh, <laughs> well, I, that was simultaneous from, that was literally I'll give that to <laughs> Councilor, uh, Councilor Moulton uh, and seconded by Councilor Labarge uh, to approve. There's no di discussion on the consent agenda, so roll call, please. Councilor Dobbs. Yes. Councilor Elkin. Yes. Councillor Garrett. Yes. Councillor Clemmer. Yes. Councillor Labarge. I, I apologize. Uh, Councillor Labarge, I didn't have my microphone on. Yes. Um, Councillor Mayori. Yes. Councillor Moulton. Yes. Councillor Perry. Yes. Councillor Yes. So that, those items pass unanim unanimously. <coughs> We're now to 24.136, the appointment of John Cartledge as police chief. Uh, Councilor Maori. Thanks. Yeah, I'm, um, like many, I feel very um, glad that the chief is willing to take this role. I support this appointment. I do have the process note that um, I think 
a positive vote would feel more impactful if it doesn't feel presumed. And so I understand the, you know, I understand the desire to have um, it ready to go to celebrate. I think it is worth celebrating, uh, but I think it would be like if you had um, sent us an invitation for a capital project that we hadn't approved of yet. I think it would be a better practice to wait until we voted um, so that vote doesn't, is, isn't perceived by anyone as performative because it's not, it's not performative and I, I know that we all um, have given it this you know, vote a lot of thought. So that would be my feedback, a process feedback, um, but uh, I am going to support this appointment. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else like to speak? Councillor Rothenberg. Yeah, I join Councillor Maori, and I find that the, the process issue that she's raising is ongoing at City Council and is something we're really trying to address. And so to address that, you know, to actually make uh, consequences, right? We have options as counselors. And one option would be to do a charter objection so the whole thing gets delayed, right? And there can be no party. Just so that we understand that council has a role. That would be a meaningless type of consequence to impose because as Councilor Maori suggested, we do support cartilage and we're happy that you, the department, support him. For me, that is the most important thing. But it is also very, very important to leave a record of the fact that council needs to be fully participating in these decisions. And so for that reason, I will just be abstaining tonight. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak? I'll just add, I, you know, I hear councilors' concerns, the perspective of the mayor's office on this. Um, it's clear, you know, the council does have the authority to disapprove or delay that can't be taken away by the scheduling of a swearing-in ceremony. Um, I think the scheduling does put a little bit of pressure on the council to pass it now, but, but we have no obligation to do so. You know, if any councilor wishes to delay or disapprove, so you can speak up and, and vote or vote accordingly. Um, ceremonies can be rescheduled or canceled. Um, you know, just personally, I would, in the future, I would prefer the appointee be approved before the announcement of a cemetery, I mean, of a ceremony. <laughs> no cemeteries, please. Um, uh, so thank you. Councillor Moulton. Um, thank you. Uh, I, I appreciate uh, the, the sentiment that's been, been raised. I, I, I don't feel that there's any pressure put on the council um, because a ceremony has been scheduled for next week. Um, if there were reasons brought forward tonight to delay or deny the confirmation of Chief Cartledge, then I'm certain the council, individual councilors would, you know, would, would respond to that with their, with their vote. I, w I, w I do want to point out that this has been a lengthy process, a six-month process. Uh, the council was well represented on the search committee with Council President Jarrett and Councilor Perry's participation. The search committee returned a unanimous recommendation to the mayor. Uh, when the mayor, uh, when the uh, and, and the mayor announced that uh, appointment on August 27th, five weeks ago, um, the uh, council referred it to City Services. Uh, I scheduled a special meeting of City Services on September 23rd. Um, and announced it at both council meetings in September. So there was plenty of, of uh, plenty of opportunity for any concerns, questions, misgivings uh, to be raised. And I haven't heard of any, nor have I had heard any expressed tonight. Um, I just I just want to point out that the council uh, has been represented during that process, and I understand. Uh, uh, Councilor Rothberg, that because of illness you weren't able to attend that city services meeting, that's completely understandable. Um, but the three councilors who were there uh, all uh, gave a positive recommendation, uh, voted for a positive recommendation for Chief Cartledge, making a total of five councilors who have been publicly on the record in favor of this, this appointment. So uh, 
I wasn't particularly bothered by the, the mayor's announcement um, yesterday. I do want to speak, uh, while I have the floor here, I do want to speak briefly to, uh, to uh, the, the, uh, the, what's before us tonight, which is the, the uh, appointment of uh, John Cartledge as police chief. Uh, we, are, we are very fortunate, I think, to have a person who has risen through the ranks since 1995 sergeant, lieutenant, captain of operations, captain of administration, and interim police chief this year to step into the job of police chief at this uh, very critical time. And um, I think that uh, from what I have heard, uh, Chief Cartledge is well respected both in the community and in the department and in, uh, with his peers uh, regionally and across the state. Uh, when you have a good internal candidate, um, I think there's still value for a job that is as important as police chief to measure that person against other people who are interested in that job. That was done during a, a, a four-month search, uh, very extensive uh, uh, search process. And uh, Chief Cartledge uh, was so well qualified that the search committee felt that there was nobody else that they wanted to present to the community as a potential chief. So I'm very happy to uh, support uh, Chief Cartledge's appointment tonight. Thank you. We'll go to Councillor Perry and then Councillor Clemmer. Sure. Um, I just wanted to state, much like Councilor Moulton said, this has been a, a lengthy process. Um, I have been honored to be a part of this on the search committee. Um, you know, the, the mayor went through uh, a, a long process of outreach, but also bringing in a firm that does this work. One of the things that really was eye-opening to me is, is learning about not only the, the state of policing uh, in our uh, surrounding area, but in general, but also realizing how lucky we are to have a candidate like Chief Cartledge here. Um, you know, the, one of the things that the firm does is really uh, highlight the uniqueness of each city that they go into. So they create c scenarios that are, are specifically designed to test the skills of each candidate. So, uh, you know, the vetting process has been thorough. Um, and, and I will also say that I've had some firsthand working experience not only with uh, Chief Cartledge, but also with the department as well. Uh, and one thing that has stood out for my time is that uh, you know, when from every step of the process, from dealing with uh, people in the department to also hiring new candidates, uh, Chief Carlage has has made sure to put forth the values of our city and to highlight the uniqueness of our city. So I am just really excited to um, to support an internal candidate who has spent so much time here and who's given to our city. And I look forward to seeing uh, how he leads this department in the future. Um, because as I've said many times, that our, our greatest resources are people. Um, and Chief Carlos is a people person. And I think that this is a, a good selection on our part, so. Thank you. Councilor Clemmer, then we'll go to Councilor Lobarge. Yeah, um, I just want to echo what uh, Councilor Smolton and Perry have said. Um, uh, not only has uh, uh, Chief Cartledge uh, gone through a 10-month process, he's been acting chief since December when um, uh, uh, Chief Casper left, um, but he's been in the force for in Northampton for 30 years. Um, we all know him. He went through a very extensive vetting process. Um, you know, nobody's spoken out against him getting this appointment in all this time, and um, you can see by the amount of officers that are here that he has a lot of support from the department. And, um, you know, the, the, the ceremony was planned, but it could easily be canceled. Um, it would, you know, be horrible to have to do that, but um, it's a lot easier to cancel it than to, to start planning now. And, um, I think you know he's a good choice. We've all talked to him. Most of us know him, and I've worked with him a lot uh, with all the rallies and that I've done. And he's always been very respectful and supportive, and um, made us all feel safe. And he also had a is supporting our um, the resolution that Council Mayori and I are presenting tonight. And um, he wants everybody to feel welcome in our community, and I really appreciate that. And I've always felt that way um, whenever I had any interactions. So I'm excited to hopefully uh, get this through tonight and enjoy the party in a week. Thank you. Councilor Labarge. Yes, uh, thank you. I have 
have to say that the mayor's office sent the application to us. We did what we're supposed to do in city service. We had a monthly interview with the acting chief coverage. And he did very well. The resolution that Debbie was just talking about, I mentioned it to him. If he had read it, he said he would. And he said no one, no matter who they are, who they are, would ever, ever be treated unfair, unfair in our city. And nobody will be threatened in our city. He read it in a kitchen, right where we wanted to hear what he would say to us. As far as booking this, I don't see why not. I think the mayor and her office, who set it up, knew that we were being interviewing him because she was there. She actually talked about him. I have all dire trust <coughs> in our new chief coverage. I've seen him when he was acting chief, what he's done for my residents on Turkey Hill Road. Very important here, very important. The meetings that he has had with total communication of our public, and he will continue with that. And a lot of people have missed that in our city, and it's time to move on. We have somebody who was born and raised in Leeds, served 30 something years to the city and worked his way from one level to another. And I can't tell you the people who told me, they are so happy, happy that he was selected. And I even mentioned it to the mayor, which I did as a city councilor. People approached and wanted to know, how come we had to hire a consultant when we had somebody in the city, worked here for 30 years, and worked tirelessly to climb that ladder. And she said, they thought that this was a good idea to move out and get people to come in. And that's not very many applicants that apply, which Amherst had the same problem. They're having problems hiring police officers. You've seen articles in the Gazette. So I have to say, I feel nothing was done inappropriate here. We spent over 40 to 50 minutes is that correct, Councillor Moulton? At least that. Correct. Just interviewing and asking him some heavy, heavy questions. So, anyways, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Councillor Elkins. Um, yes. So, um, I was gonna. I was. I was maybe not gonna make remarks, but uh, everybody else has. So, um, <laughs> I. I just wanted to say that uh, I. Um, had the I've had the opportunity uh, over m m a, a nearly 20 year career of encountering um, Chief Cartledge in a different way than many folks, which is to say in police reports. <laughs> um, and I, I just wanted to let it be known that I have, um, if there's any constituency that would have the goods on a poor applicant um, for this posi position, it's the defense bar. Um, and I can tell you that, that I uh, was very glad to see your nomination and to see you come through this process with the integrity and um, forthrightness and commitment to this city and the city's values and processes. Um, and I have heard that from many of my colleagues. So I just wanted um, to share that with you and say I'm very glad that we're here tonight. Um, and um, I don't think uh, I would not expect any new information to change how tonight would go, um, but I certainly don't think this council would hesitate to do its job and, and if, if that were necessary. And I knew when you were a part of the process and when the mayor brought your name forward um, that that's not what was going to be happening, <laughs> that we were going to be hearing a great deal about an excellent career. Thank you. Uh, would anyone who hasn't spoken like to speak? Okay, uh, Councillor Clemmer actually had her hand up, and then Councillor Maori. Um, yeah, I just want to add to what I said before. Um, Car Captain Cartledge, he, uh, Councillor Barge thoughtfully asked a question at when they were ta uh, interviewing him, and um, 
it, he's not just, it's not just hollow words, because the rallies I've done have been for everything from LGBTQ rights, abortion, women's rights, impeachment, and many, many other um, topics. And with each one, he's treated it, them all the same and um, didn't show any partiality to any one more than the other and treated us all fairly and respectfully. So, um, you know, he walks the talk. He's not just uh, telling us what we want to hear now. Councillor Mary. Yeah, I just want to add a couple things. One is just to think, this is just a process. This isn't about, you know, how, how many you know, committees it's gone to, but for the public, part of transparency is not being confusing. And it is confusing, If it has confused constituents, I know, if you have scheduled something before the vote. I want this vote to feel powerful and, and, and hold the value that it does. And if it seems at all performative, even perceives, that's what I'm saying, I, we all know that it isn't. But I think we really need to think about um, our, our public that way. So I will drop that and I want to end on another note because um, Councillor Clemmer jogged the memory of the first time that I met Chief Cartledge, probably Captain Cartledge then, was the Women's March. Mm -hmm. And we didn't know what we were doing and it was a time when you didn't know who, how many people were gonna show up and the grace and the kind of nerves of steel of that uh, Chief, uh, Chief Cart Cartledge displayed at that, uh, especially that really big uh, march that really was thousands of people. And the way you were just, you had a very soothing um, presence, you somehow brought a sense of, of um, Kind of, kind of safety and order to the to the march without actually being a really big presence, at least a very big visual presence, and, and we all benefited from it. We had a great day because of it, and so I thank you for that. And I've seen, yeah, I've seen in action, lots of different subject matters come up, lots of different types of rallies, and um, and the same kind of um, stayed um, thoughtful response. So I. I, I thank you for that, and thank you for um, jogging my memory, Debbie. Okay, that's all I got to say. Thank you. Councilor Rothenberg. So I also want to recognize that we have the sheriff here tonight in support, which is very nice. And I showed him this earlier. His colleague, Dr. Katie, who does the substance abuse there, made this bag for me, Hamp Ward 3, which we love. But I bring it up because I just want to respond to the to the comments of my fellow counselors and I want to make very clear I heard a lot about whether you were personally okay with this process and I want to be clear as I always do and I often do I haven't done yet tonight Ward 3 was troubled by this process this wasn't me personally being troubled and in fact the first person to flag it for me was a retired police department member who's very much in support of this appointment. So I just am noting it for you, really for you as a council, also for the mayor. But we have a reputation right now of being rubber stamps. And when we publicly make affirmations that we're okay with that, I just want you to think about what it is that you're accomplishing for yourself and for your wards by making those statements. So again, I support you, I'm excited you're here, and and I think this is a step up for us. I think this is an improvement. I think you're going to be a great chief. So thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak? And um, I'll just add, I uh, had the privilege to serve on the search committee. I'm confident that Captain or Chief Cartledge was the best candidate. Um, I really appreciate your commitment to Northampton and your open-mindedness. Um, and um, looking forward to working with you, uh, especially as we continue to work uh, looking at the recommendations of the Policing Review Commission and looking to see how, how we can continue to, to implement those. Um, and so I'd entertain a motion to approve. Second. second. Oh. Motion made by Councillor Maori and seconded by, no, sorry. Motion made by Councillor Elkins and seconded by Councillor Clemmer. Any more discussion? A roll call, please. Councillor Elkins? Yes. Councillor Jarrett? Yes. Councillor Clemmer? Yes. Councillor Labarge? 
Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. Councillor Moulton. Yes. Councillor Perry. Yes. Councillor Rothenberg. Epstein. And Councillor Dubbs. Yes. Okay, that passes with eight yes votes and one abstention. Congratulations. We will do 10 minute recess. We'll be back at 
Welcome back to the Northampton City Council. Uh, Councilor Mayori, you had a re have a request? I do. I was, um, I was hoping you would consider moving the resolution declaring Northampton a sanctuary city for transgender and gender diverse people to the next item. Um, we, Great. Yeah, I, we have um, constituents. I, I'm fine with that. Is there any objections? Okay, we will take up 24.146, resolution declaring Northampton a sanctuary city for transgender and gender diverse people. This is in second reading. Uh, would the sponsors like to lead us off? Yeah, before I forget, I actually wanted to say, um, Councillor Elkins wasn't here last week, uh, I mean last meeting, but I wanted to thank her personally uh, to, uh, and actually member um, Foster Canon for uh, the resolution that we mentioned here, an act providing for a gender neutral designation on state documents and identifications. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you. And that is passed. Yeah, by the way. right, yeah, so very exciting. <laughs> and so you can see how we've all, you know, we've we have a clear path here. We've been establishing like bricks that we've been uh, putting, putting, putting up um, to you know, to keep um, our city safe and wel welcome welcoming for transgender and gender diverse folks. Um, we said so much last time, it was really moving. It, we've, uh, Councilor Clymer can tell you we've gotten a lot of outreach uh, over this. It, I think it's really hitting home um, with folks. Um, we are following up with the mayor who I know has, has shown a, um, a, a lot of support. So I'm not gonna say much more than that. Um, but uh, just uh, feeling grateful to be here in Northampton at, at any time, but especially at this time in history. And just to say, you know, it's probably not surprising that I am someone who would support Harris, <laughs> at, at, um, at Harris administration, but I think why this is um, important is even in that best case scenario, in my opinion, these oppressive forces are not going away it's not going to just all go away um even if even if we um don't see a trump presidency this is going to be with us and they are well funded and we need to lead the way as a city that's fortified by our goodwill and our forward thinking um, i'm really proud of this resolution and of our city for supporting it and uh, thank mayor shara for supporting us and the chief and um, I mean we do need this resolution you know people aren't safe here and anywhere not only here but if there's a change in the administration we're definitely going to need this in place and um, I'm really proud that we're one of the first uh, cities um, to have this resolution and become a sanctuary city for transgender and gender diverse people and uh, hopefully someday we won't need to do things like this, but um, right now we do and we still do. And um, we just want everybody to feel welcome and safe here. So um, I'm hoping this passes tonight and, uh, and uh, we can welcome everybody here and, and other cities will follow suit. Thank you. Councilor Elkins. And I, I wasn't here at the last meeting when it was introduced, um, so I, I, I'm not, so I wasn't able to speak to it. So, and I won't say much except for to say thank you um, to both the sponsors um, for your work on this. I, I couldn't agree more that it is a, that these resolutions, a lot of people want to write them off as not meaningful or, 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 or uh, but, but they are, they contribute to the passage of legislation at the federal and state level. Our legislators tell us repeatedly that it matters when we express this kind of um, shared um, consensus um, from this body uh, and the city. And, um, and I, I'm, I'm so glad to be a part of it. And uh, thank you for your work on this. And I'm, I am confident um, that it is reflective of the values of this city and, and the way we already govern ourselves and the way we already uh, are police and, and city staff and everybody um, does their best to to conduct themselves and to uh, and to and to be this kind of city and it's good to commit it to 
to writing to to, co to a committed to resolution. So, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Labarge. Yes, thank you. Um, I said what I had to say two weeks ago on this resolution, and also in city service, I questioned our new chief about that resolution, and he read it. He read it, and he said that is their job as police officers that we are a sanctuary city, and everybody has the right, the right to live and feel safe and be part of our city, even visitors coming in here. I feel that this resolution, really the language in it is sound, sound, of what we feel about the strength we have as counselors to make sure on this resolution that no matter who you are, who you are, you are safe. You are safe, our children, families, in our sanctuary city. So thank you both sponsors for producing this resolution. Thank you. Other counselors? Well, I'll add, uh, I think, you know, this is an important step, ensuring that transgender and gender diverse people get the respect and safety they deserve. We can't protect everyone, but I think this is an important statement. I look forward to Mayor Shara's executive policy orders that will add to this. Uh, and would someone like to I'll move to Oh, Councillor Dubs. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'd just like to reiterate my support that I mentioned last at the last meeting for this resolution. Um, <clears throat> and while to us uh, fellow councillors, uh, it may seem like a no-brainer type of resolution. Um, I think we all know that in other cities in, in the country, it's, it's not so much a no-brainer because there would be people against this resolution. And so I'm grateful to be on a council that agrees on this. And, and um, so thank you. And great job on this. Thank you. I'll move to approve. Seconded. Motion made by Councillor Perry and seconded by Councillor Labarge. Discussion? <laughs> Seeing none, roll call, please. Councillor Elkins. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Clemmer. Yes. Councillor Labard. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. Councillor Moulton. Yes. Councillor Perry. Yes. Councillor Rothenberg. Yes. And Councillor Dubbs. Yes. That passes unanimously. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you to Sco Scotia. Okay, we will go back up to the top and go to our financial order on first reading. This is 24.155, an order to reprogram hotel bridge funds for sidewalk repair. Um, and this is sponsored by the mayor's office. Uh, would, you, would you like to speak to it? Director Lascali is also here. Um, so this is the hotel bridge. I know this is a project that some, especially or including Council Mayori, have um, championed and look forward to. Uh, unfortunately, like many projects, the bids for this project have come in just astro astronomically higher than what um, had been appropriated. So it's just not a feasible project at this time. Um, so what we are proposing, and thank you, Councilor Mayori, for the conversations I know you've had with Director Scalia. Um, uh, we're proposing um, that we have identified some of the higher priority sidewalk repairs and upgrades based on our inventory study, injury reports, and also in consultation with the Disability Commission, and are asking the Council to reappropriate those funds for this purpose. Um, and this will also include some work in Leeds on Florence Street. Um, and uh, just to note, we'll be asking for further appropriations for paving and sidewalks in the capital plan. Um, and we'll be trying to bring those requests earlier this year uh, to be able to bid them competitively. So um, we are asking to reprogram this money to put it towards sidewalks. And um, because unfortunately, this project is just uh, very, would be too, too expensive to do. And Director Luscali can talk to um, kind of specifics if there are questions. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Labarge. Yes, um, I 
Welcome, Director. Yes. <laughs> Hi, Counselor. Hi. Nice to meet you. Yes. When was the last consulting report completed on sidewalks throughout the city of Northampton? I know Councilor <coughs> and I have talked about that. Do you have when that report was completed? Yeah, we used uh, uh, an engineering firm by the name of Alta, and they finished their report in 2017. Yeah, thank you, Councillor. Just very briefly, m my comment is that, you know, we have asset inventory reports on all of our assets, it, you know, water mains and store mains and, and uh, all of the things that the DPW um, is in control of. And it, the challenge for us is that these are dynamic things and they change year over year. We have limited funding to address the deficiencies that are found. So, you know, the report that we did in 2017, it, you know, we focused on downtown business districts, we focused on areas close to schools, and, you know, we have priorities based on existing conditions in 2017, which have only deteriorated, and we have not had the funding and the capability to address those areas that have been identified. So for us to sort of go through and say we'd like a new inventory, I, you know, I think inventories are good. They're very useful. You sort of get a fresh set of eyes on things, you know, every so many years but you're looking at close to a six-figure level of effort to come in and study the same deficient sidewalks that were deficient in 2017 that are even more deficient now. So I think we have to make good decisions around how we are spending our limited sidewalk funds. If we have $100,000, do we want to continue to study sidewalks or do you want us to fix the sidewalks? And so I think that that's the goal at this point is we have the money and we're going after the sidewalks. And, and we can certainly contemplate coming in with a fresh set of eyes and sort of re-looking at everything, but we are gonna generate a similar list um, that says our sidewalks are in poor condition. So it's just something to think about as we make decisions moving forward. Thank you. Um, the, we all, since 2017, I forget the exact year, we also came up, uh, we did a study, the Complete Streets Prioritization Plan. Could you speak to how you'll take, you know, the question of the side, of which sidewalks should be prioritized and will that plan 
factor in? Yeah, and I think it's, it, it starts to get a little tricky because we also have our complete streets ordinance um, that requires us to pay attention to sidewalks when we're paving streets. And our streets have their own inventory and sometimes streets um, are in disrepair but the sidewalks aren't in as much disrepair as other areas that we want to target. So we have kind of this um, amalgamation of plans, um, it, it, you know, it, kind of exactly what you're talking about. I've got the sidewalk inventory, I've got the complete streets ordinance, and then I have our prioritization plan, and they don't necessarily align. So we have to make the best decisions we can possibly make in looking at everything we're trying to do and then route the limited resources we have. Councilor Elkins. Thank you. Um, sorry, didn't mean to jump the gun there. Um, is it a fair guess to say, though, that the, the streets and the funding we get from the state and other sources prioritizes the streets and the cars over the sidewalks? So, like, if they're out of sync, is the street always going to win? It, well, we get a million dollars a year from Chapter 90, a little bit over a million dollars a year, and that number has been static for forever, you know, <laughs> since the early part of this century. So with that million dollars, it's based on our lean miles. Uh, it's a formula. So the million dollars comes in, and we can use it for our streets, sidewalks, bridges, traffic signals, or drainage. That's what we can use it for. We have almost 40 bridges in Northampton. We don't talk about bridges a lot, but they're really expensive. And we don't talk about traffic signals a lot, but those are also expensive. And every pedestrian crossing solar array that we install, you know, has maintenance costs and installation costs. So the million dollars we have to take that million dollars and say, what is the best use of this million dollars? Do cars always win? It depends on how bad the problem is. Um, sometimes we just close the road, like Lovefield Street, because it's not affordable to reopen it. We've got a culvert on Federal Street with a road collapsing, you know, that's down to one lane that it is more than a million dollars to repair. That's our entire Chapter 90 appropriation for the entire year that we're supposed to be using on sidewalks, bridges, traffic signals, everything else in the whole wide world. So that's the sort of challenges that we're up against. So these are really fraught decisions to say like, where are we going to, where are we going to send this money? Which plan am I going to look at? You know, sometimes it boils down to, we've had multiple people injured in front of Michael's house on State Street. We need to send some money there. If these are folks who are actually getting seriously injured. Those reports come to me. You know, we go down, we look at the sidewalk, we say this is terrible and it needs to be repaired. That rises to the top of the list irrespective of any other plan that we have because that's the actual reality on the ground, which may actually be different from 2017. Thank you. Councillor Moulton. Thank you. Um, so I just want to be clear here. We're, we're adding this $823,631 to the $250,000 in the capital improvement plan. Is that is that correct, Mayor? We, sorry, say again. So we're taking the, it's 822000 Uh Turn your mic on. Yeah, so we're reappropriating the 822631 And in addition to the 250000 in the capital improvement program. <coughs> um, yeah, for so sidewalk. We've got a, over a million dollars we're going to be spending on sidewalk repairs this year. Yes. Okay, that's great news. Um, but I think it's important, as as you've pointed out, as counselors and you've pointed out, Director Lascaille, to be very uh, careful in how those decisions are made about how that money is going to get spent. And I'm glad to hear Disability Commission, critical, where people are getting hurt, where that's been documented, critical. And I'm, I'm hoping that it's going to be possible to uncouple sidewalks, some sidewalks that are in terrible disrepair from the repaving of the, the associated street, because those two often go, go hand in hand. And I also think it's important that we make sure that each section of the city gets, gets some of that money. 
Yes, and it's, it, it's difficult to decouple the sidewalks from the streets because we have a complete streets ordinance which requires them to be coupled uh, really under uh, almost all circumstances. Um, so, you know, the ordinance is driving a lot of what we have to do and we're, we're sort of losing our pavement condition index for our roadways and I, I'm sure all of you hear from your constituents about you know the poor condition of the roadways in the city but when we are forced to to upgrade sidewalks as part of the complete streets ordinance on roads which we otherwise would not target because the sidewalk isn't that bad relative to other areas you can't decouple and the other problem is we have curbing we have trees we have utilities um, and sometimes it makes more sense to do the sidewalks with the roadway. So the sidewalks are part of a larger network of sort of DPW things, and, and we, we really have to take it case by case, but our hope for this $820,000 um, is to make a discrete sidewalk project to come in and target some very particular areas of the city that need attention. So that is the intention of <coughs> Money and it's certainly not enough to do everything that's needed, but it'll it, you know it'll start to make a dent. Okay, well that sounds very promising. Um, if I could just make a direct response to that, I know you and I have met to talk about the complete streets ordinance, and it's certainly something that we could consider making it more flexible while still holding the accountability uh, for requiring the spending that's necessary on on sidewalks and and other other forms you know complete streets that the complete streets ordinance requires but we also have the ability through the transportation and parking commission to for some exceptions to that so um you know we're not completely stuck uh we we did some for this year's paving projects we were able to to choose not to put a sidewalk on a very quiet dead end street, for example, uh, because it just made sense to put that, that money elsewhere. Uh, Councillor Maori and then Councillor Elkins. Right, just a uh, spoiler alert that I'll, I'll be asking you all to refer this to finance um, to unpack this a little bit more. This is a, a very emotional. Um, project for leads. I want to have as many opportunities for the public to weigh in. Uh, so, not to not to say we can't discuss it at length, but just to know also that I w I'm hoping that you will allow me to bring it to finance, uh, uh, you know, or any subcommittee that's interested to give another um, venue for the public. And uh, so, I'll just I'll just mention that uh, the director has um, met with. Um, met with the lead civic, has met with me, I met with lead civic, I'm meeting with them again. Um, she's being very responsive and available and I think that they are understanding the dilemma and the impasse that we're in and I know um, from the history of it that the director, um, you know, really put all she could into this project and we're just hitting, um, we're really hitting an impasse where we're going to have to make some tough decisions. I have some lingering questions about that, um, but I'm, but I don't have any question that the director has tried all that she can to to make this go forward. I know that my constituents have some questions about, you know, the bridge. It's it's not going to just stay static. It's going to keep degrading. And what what does that mean for leads? And um, I've talked to the director about some beautification issue you know, ideas to kind of help out with that, um, that's kind of the, we can, perhaps that's a good subcommittee conversation because I, my feeling is that bridge has been there a while and it, it doesn't degrade overnight in a, in a very dramatic way. We're not gonna wake up and find it floating down the river. But anyway, this is, this is why I wanna refer it to a subcommittee. Um, and, um, and I just appreciate the director's, um, you know, uh, willingness to answer a lot of questions. It's it's really been, it's like a grieving process. Um, the, the meeting went on, you know, you could see there's bargaining, there's acceptance, there's going back to bargaining. And so I think we need a little process time, but I also know there's a little bit of a clock with the sidewalk, um, potential sidewalk uh, contracts. So anyway, <laughs> that's my report. And I'm meeting again with uh, Lead Civic next week to tell them about this meeting and to tell them where we're referring it to. Thank you. Councillor Elkins. 
Um, yeah, and I, I, just to piggyback uh, on, you know, I, I think in the end it's going to make a lot of sense. You know, sidewalks are very, it's just a big, it's a very needful thing in the city um, to address. And we've been talking about this bridge. I've come to learn a lot um, about its importance to your, you know, in your ward and to, to folks who grew up there and who just know it and love that access and what it means um, to that neighborhood. So I, I did want to just name that it's a little heartbreaking <laughs> to let this one go. And I do, it is absolutely the case that, that uh, Director Lascaglia has been trying to make a go of it. And, um, and the money that we have spent to explore that uh, is, I believe, money well spent. I, I hope in my fantasy world, maybe that's something that some, uh, you know, some other organization or somebody, you know, folks working on that issues around that neighborhood or um, an interest in conservation and pedestrian bike, maybe it'd be a big project for anybody to pick up, but it's important, the groundwork that we did to, to understand it. So I'm supportive of having your constituents in particular, having some opportunity to, to ask more questions and come to terms with it. I, I want them to hear how much work has gone into understanding what the process is where how much more it was going to cost than what we had anticipated and, and what those what those realities meant um, I think that's really important um, for your award in particular council Mayor. so um, I certainly would support that recommendation thank you councillor Labarge yes and it was amazing because I showed my husband the order he said oh no I don't you know and he said born and raised on Water Street when he was young, he rode his bicycle on that bridge. Timmy, me, and a whole bunch of cars, his parents, his parents would walk to the little general store to get their food and so forth. There's a tremendous amount of memories on that bridge. But times are changing now. And sidewalks are very valuable, very valuable to make all our children and families safe. I think that at some point, a little rainbow will happen, Councilor Mariotti, and we'll find the pot of gold so we can revive <laughs> with that bridge. Believe me, I have many family members in Ward 7, and they would understand this, that sidewalks are extremely important. And I agree that to refer this to Finance Committee. I think that's an excellent, excellent idea. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Moulton. Yes, I too um, support the idea of, of sending it to finance. Maybe we'll find a pot of gold that night. Um, uh, but it's important, uh, Councilor Mayori, for your constituents to fully understand um, what the, you know, why, why this decision is being made and what's behind it. Um, so that's very important to, to have that discussion, and it's also important, I think, to, for, for people throughout the city to understand uh, that we're talking about some major uh, spending on, on sidewalks and to understand how, how decisions are going to be made about where that money gets spent. So yes, I uh, think uh, uh, referring it to finances is, is a terrific idea. Councilor Rothenberg. So I would just like to know a little bit about some of that here tonight. So can you tell me um, a little bit about the bridge? How much was set aside for the bridge? It was the 823 or 822? It was, so there were a couple of different appropriations. There was a, a bond for $450,000. And then I, I don't know if it came from free cash or I, I don't recall the source. Um, so it did, it came, um, it was uh, free cash for stabilization was the second 450, and then there was two small orders um, from the um, transportation. Um, is it called? It's written on the bottom. Yeah, there. It, it's like the um, the Uber money, we, we yeah. like mitigation money. Yeah. Um, so there were. Um, yeah, here we go. Two thousand three hundred eighty-three dollars and fifty cents um, was 2021's mitigation money. And then there was one thousand one hundred eighteen dollars and fifty cents um, in twenty twenty two. Okay, so when did you uh, do the free cash stabilization appropriation? 
Does anybody recall? Yeah, it's on there, Donna. Um, it's on the top. It's 2020. Yeah, three. sorry. I'm here. 2020. Yeah. Okay. And so what, what did the bids come back at? So we bid this project three times. Um, so the first time we bid it was in 2021. And the bid was 1.95 million in 2021. So we, and we only got one bid. And the, the project estimate was half a million dollars. I mean, that was our engineer's estimate. So I think for half a million dollars, everyone felt like this was a project that was gonna feel good. The appropriations that we had in place were going to pay for the construction, they were gonna pay for a contingency, and then they were gonna pay for a construction oversight. So and that before, sorry, before you move on to the next one, who was the engineer who gave that estimate? Greenman Peterson, GPI. So they're a, um, a, a Massachusetts engineering firm and they actually specialize in bridges. So they were a, a obvious choice um, to do the work. So w when we ended up with you know, more than $500,000, the idea was we needed a cushion, you know, in case something came in over. So we got one bid, which was not at all what we expected. And when we got the one bid, we called the people who didn't bid. And we said, why did you not bid on this project? If we, you know, for, like, let's have a conversation about this. And the consensus was that there was too much risk. Um, you know, the bridge contractors are used to working on 91 or the Mass Pike, and, you know, they can see what they've got, and it's pretty standard bridge, and, and it's regular routine work for them. This is a, you know, truss bridge from the 1880s, and it's sort of complicated, and, you know, there was just a lot of fear around we're going to touch one thing and the rest of it might fall over. So we spoke to GPI after speaking to the bidders who didn't bid, and we said, what can you do to make everybody feel more comfortable? So we spent the next two years doing more engineering, including floating a barge in the river under the bridge to sort of you know, get an up-close look, and we did lead paint testing and you know, checked pins and did everything we could to try to rewrite the specs to get bidders to a place where they were more comfortable. So we bid the project again, um, bid number two, May 24th, 2023. We got one bid for $1,987,000. So that was not what we were hoping for. Um, so again, we called, you know, identical conversation from two years earlier, same answer. We did a little bit more engineering. We bid it again, July 24th of this year, um, and the low bid was 1.65 million. So we're moving, you know, in a better direction, <coughs> but by the time you figure in a contingency and construction administration, the project is just not affordable. Okay, so thank you for that history uh, i will say that ward three is extremely interested in sidewalks you know we meet all the time we're working on really citywide coalitions of residents I and mean, it's a massive massive topic that being said the residents of ward three who are really leading that charge are uncomfortable with this being a process of taking money from a leads project to give to another thing that's important, right? Like they're both important. And we see ourselves as a city with resources. We see ourselves as a city with a great bond rating with about $8 million of free cash coming back. And I don't think that my constituents, while they'll, they will be grateful for sidewalk work, they are not pleased with the way in which this is being financed, that it's taking from one village to give to the others. So I just want to name that and let you know that it's not just a leads issue. You know, this is about how the community feels about each other. Um, and that does resonate into the other wards as well. So uh, as to the sidewalk costs, I'm glad to hear you raise that there's ways to navigate the complete streets ordinance because I have been wondering if that is hindering more than it's helping in some ways. I mean, it's really tragic, the, the slow rate at which we get to sidewalks. Mm -hmm. And they're sort of the perfect is the enemy of done situation that I've been wondering about. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad to hear that. Um, but I really think that we could do better 
in terms of how we finance this. And, and I think, again, back to going back to process, you know, this is a multi-step order. This is asking us to first declare that we're taking that away from leads. Um, you know, the way that I would look at it, the way that Ward 3 would look at it is you need to add a million dollars to leads or 800,000 and you need to add a lot of money to the sidewalks. I mean, really, we should be doing the whole city um, and that we can and should be doing both. So those are my comments tonight, but I agree that the process should be drawn out. I think we should have as many conversations as we can ahead of your deadlines. Tell us more about sidewalk bidding deadlines. Um, but what we need to do, the most important thing that I can know now is that we have the money so that we can develop the projects. I, I would like to bid this right after the holidays um, because that's when you get more favorable bid prices. Even if the contractor does not mobilize until May or June, it, we want to be first on their list. So we, we don't want to be trying to bid this like in May. So before I wrote internal resources towards the design and development of these projects, um, it's important that we understand that we have the funding. So, it, you know, I certainly, Councilor Mayor and I talked about this, we don't need two readings, um, you know, but I would like to have this nailed down this month so that we can do the work we need to do internally and I can have this out to bid you know, in January, that, that's what I would like to do. And just a closing on, on this whole line of questioning, the, the sidewalks that do end up getting done as a part of this proposal or the money that we're setting aside potentially for this, I would really like to see a consultation to city council from the disability commission. I understand that they, they speak with you directly, but I, I really think if and when we move forward on more sidewalks, the conversation about which ones is just as important as the giving of the money itself. And I would like to not just freely give the money, I would like to have a clear understanding that we're really creating routes that are traversable to people that are useful, that are connecting main arteries as much as possible. So I hope that there would be a procedural way that, that we can be speaking with Disability Commission in some kind of formal capacity, whether that's city services or finance or full council, but I, I know they spend a great deal of time on this. I'd like to hear from them. Thank you. Uh, would anyone like to make a motion to refer? Oh, go ahead, Councilor Dubs. Oh, sorry, yeah, I just wanted to make a comment real quick. Yes. Um, um, so yeah, um, to, first I just wanted first to mention that um, like I do wish that the money f that is going to towards sidewalks, uh, that we're suggesting to go to towards sidewalks, I wish it wasn't coming from the hotel bridge um, funds to repair the bridge, but um, at the same time, um, being someone who's so uh, uh, hyper-focused on sidewalks and passionate about repairing the sidewalks in Northampton, I am happy to hear that uh, there's going to be more money going towards them, so I wanted to mention that. And <coughs> and then also to, to Councilor Rothenberg's point, um, <coughs> yeah, and, and, uh, and as Donna as Skelly is aware, um, we've recently been having a conversation, like an ongoing conversation on the Disability Commission about sidewalks. Um, we've all been, we've all the members of the commission have been um, going over the um, the sidewalk inventory and like looking at it very closely, and then making our own suggestions to see what we could add to, you know, what uh, more uh, suggestions for for repairs that weren't on the the sidewalk inventory. Um, so just wanted to mention that that is a conversation that's been happening, and I know that. Um, so I guess I just wanted to ask you. I know that you've been having, like, you've been in, in touch with Amy Sugihara, who's the chair of the Disability Commission, and and not to put you on the spot, but just wondering, like, where how you think that's going, that conversation is going, and how you think it could have an effect on this whole project. I think it's been very helpful, and I actually have a meeting with Amy and Emma on Friday. Awesome. Um, to talk a little bit more. So they've given me a list of sort of priorities from the Disability Commission, um, and that list definitely marries with our inventory and marries with some of the things that we would like to do with this money if approved. Um, and so the purpose of the conversation on Friday is going to be to talk a little bit about the nuance of the Complete Streets Ordinance where the perfect is the enemy of the good. Um, and you know, it's requiring concrete sidewalks on both sides of the street, for example, when some streets just don't have a sidewalk or have a sidewalk in disrepair. Um, so it, you know, we're gonna sort of go through the ordinance and talk about some of our challenges and how I would have to request exemptions get for various streets that we needed to pave because they're in disrepair. Um, so it's just, 
more so both of us can understand. You know, they want to understand a little bit more about the Complete Streets challenges, and I want to understand more about what their priorities are, and then see how we can sort of marry everything together. So that's how the conversation is going. Great, awesome, thank you. I appreciate that. Councilor Elkins. Move to refer to finance. Second. Made by Councilor Elkins and seconded by Councilor Moulton. With the understanding, Councilor Elkins, that we have that finance meeting before October 17th Council meeting so that we'll have a report back to the to the Council. I'm not the chair, but. Well, I know. Uh, but <laughs> yes, that, but yes. That's, but we, we, we've heard uh, Director Lascaia ask for this to be buttoned up uh, in October. So. We would we would aim to have a meeting between now and October 17th. Yes. Okay. Yep. yep. That, that's amenable. Great. Uh, discussion on referral to finance. Uh, Councilor Rothenberg. I would just uh, ask. I don't know if this is ordinary. If you ever do this as a council, but I would ask uh, that finance look into alternative financing options besides taking it from the bridge. Thank you for that request. Yeah, Councilor. Just a thank you. And, and, and look for the other $800,000 for the bridge. Right, yes. And thank you for the, the reminder suggestion about the checking in with the Disability Commissioner mm -hmm. and thinking about uh, that aspect as well. Any further discussion? Okay, roll call on referral to finance. Who is the second? Uh, Councilor Elkin. Councilor Moulton. Thank you. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Clemmer. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. Councillor Moulton. Yes. Councillor Perry. Yes. Councillor Rothenberg. Yes. Councillor Dubbs. Yes. And Councillor Elkins. Yes. Okay, that passes unanimously. <laughs> and we'll, we'll look to uh, Thanks, everyone. scheduling. Thank you, Director. Thank you, Director. Um, we now move on to orders, 24.149, an order to approve an exemption for Mary Ann McKenna contract for personnel services. This is in second reading. We This was introduced and discussed at our September 19th meeting, and it is now up for a vote. Um, would, does anyone need a, a refresher? I know there were a couple folks who weren't here. We've done these before uh, where we approve an exemption. Okay, then I would uh, entertain a motion to approve. I'll move to approve. Second. Uh, <laughs> all right. <laughs> motion made by Councillor Perry, and I'll give the second to Councillor Clemmer. Um, any discussion? Okay, roll call, please. Councillor Clemmer. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. Councillor Moulton. Yes. Councillor Perry. Yes. Councillor Rothenberg. Yes. Councillor Dubbs. Yes. Councillor Elkins. Yes. And Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Okay, that passes unanimously. Um, <coughs> Laura, would you make Pamela Powers a co host? Sure. Um, next is 24.150, oh, the warrant for the November 5th, 2024 mm -hmm. state election. And I will uh, give a summary because it's rather long. Um, so it's a warrant to establish the date, time, and location of an upcoming election for Massachusetts state election on November 5th, 2024. Um, so this is uh, Ward 1, precincts A and B will be in the Jackson Street School Gymnasium. Ward 2, precincts A and B will be in the Smith Vocational Agricultural High School Gymnasium Building B. Ward 3, precinct A and B in the Senior Center Great Room. Ward 4, Precinct A in the Senior Center, Patty's Front Room. Ward 4, Precinct B in the Senior Center, Activity Room. Um, all the Senior Center is at 67 Con Street. Ward 5, Precinct A in the Florence Civic and Business Building at 90 Park Street. Ward 5, Precinct B in the Smith Vocational Agricultural High School Gymnasium Building B. Ward 6, Precincts A and B in the Robert K. Finn Ryan Road School Gymnasium. Ward 7, Precinct A in the JFK Middle School Community Room, and Ward 7, Precinct B in the Leeds School Gymnasium, lower level. Uh, the polls are open from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m., and um, the, there are, in addition to electors of President and Vice President for the United States, there's Senator in Congress, 
representative in Congress, second congressional district, the counselor for the eighth district, the senator in general court for Hampshire, Franklin, and Worcester district, the representative in general court for the first Hampshire district, the clerk of courts for Hampshire County, the register of deeds for Hampshire district, the register of probate to fill a vacancy for Hampshire County, and then the five uh, ballot questions. Um, and I, I won't summarize those, but those uh, have been, uh, we've, we've probably all received the booklet that summarizes the five questions. So, who is Clerk Powers with us? Yes, welcome Clerk Powers. Would you like to uh, speak to this warrant? Yeah, this is the, the warrant for the state election happening on November 5th. Uh, the language in the uh, the actual warrant itself is direct from the state. They indicate what language the clerk should be using for the questions as well as, so uh, one thing that I think everyone uh, is aware is that we are doing both by mail and in person. The in-person early voting will be for 10 days prior to the November 5th election, starting for seven, uh, excuse me, um, starting continuously on October 19th and running through uh, November 1st. We have the hours up on our website and folks can visit uh, the city clerk's page regarding elections to figure out uh, when they'd like to come to do early voting in person. Um, in addition to that, we have over 7,500 requests for early vote ballots by mail. We are working on getting those uh, out the door as quickly as possible as the ballots for the November 5th election were actually received yesterday. yesterday um, and we're just glad that they're finally here and Hopefully we can get them into the hands of voters by early next week. Great, thank you. Uh, any questions for Clerk Powers? <coughs> Councilor Rothenberg. Clerk Powers, I just want to thank you and your staff for working so hard all the time for the city. Thank you. Really unsung heroes. Really appreciate it. Thank yeah. you. Councilor Mayori. Um, yeah, Clerk Powers, how is it going with uh, getting election workers? You well, are uh, we, we have our usual uh, crew of election workers, but we are adding some positions. I do have a folder with about 30 names of folks who are interested in working elections. I will be having an information session for those folks uh, sometime this month, probably in the next couple of weeks. They'll be getting a mailing from me inviting them to participate in a discussion about what elections are like, uh, what positions we have available, and um, giving them the opportunity to perhaps, if possible, allow them to work where they choose. So it's, I, think, I think we have a good, healthy amount of folks interested in working this upcoming election, though. That's good news. Councilor Clemmer. OK. There are other questions? Uh, or Councillor Labarge. Yes. And I'm going to echo what Corbyn said. I say it all the time. <laughs> a lot of people don't realize you and your staff, Amy and your other staff, how they work tirelessly, tirelessly. And I commend you and all your staff for working tirelessly here. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's it, the position, uh, you know, in the clerk's office is very unique. Uh, a lot of what we do is driven by state law, and um, folks, you know, just are, um, you know, very receptive to a lot of the things that we are required to do. Um, but there are sometimes questions about, you know, why we do the things you know, the way that we do. Why can't, you know, domestic voters, for example, those who live in the U.S., why can't they vote electronically? Um, what does it mean to, you know, to be an overseas voter and how does that work? You know, all this stuff is driven by state law and uh, it's, there's a lot of nuances to 
just about everything we do in this office. So thank you. Thank you for yeah. your and I do know for a fact Please. you are there mostly every night, every night. Yeah. Working. Yeah, dur during election season it can get pretty uh, it can get pretty busy here. Uh, we you know the, in addition to the questions that come in, uh, there is the workload. You know, seventy five hundred ballots is a lot of ballots, and it uh, requires a process that we have to sort of be in control of all the time. I mean. We can't let the work build up. Every um, application that comes in has to be handled right away because the next flow of activities and the next flow of work uh, and the next flow of events, um, you know, is just so unpredictable. And we rely a lot on other departments, sexual services especially. They're very. Um, helpful in terms of helping us get the ballots out the door. They help us get the mailings done to voters. Um, tomorrow we'll be coming in at 730 to get um, over a thousand ballots, get postage on those and get those over to the post office. Um, and all, all kinds of things around setup, the early voting setup, the election day setup, all that requires support from um, central services and other departments. And, and we really do, it's not a, you know, a one department event. It really does take a lot of uh, other folks being involved in that as well, so. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Councilor Clemmer. Hi, um, I just have a quick question. Um, will you be having um, designated parking spots um, for the people that come for early voting by City Hall? Yep, so we do We do have designated par parking spots on Crafts Avenue. Um, that's a convenient location for two reasons. One is that it allows easy access um, to the side entrance of City Hall and then the elevator goes right up to the second floor. Um, and the spots there, you know, we are allowed to sort of reserve three or four spots so that it's just available to voters who come in and do the early voting. So yeah, we will be having those designated spots again. Um, that's another department that we rely on in terms of, you know, helping to support elections is the parking office as well, so yeah. Okay, thank you, yeah, that was really uh, helpful for people. Yep, so we generally have the, uh, the drop box out in front of City Hall open only once the ballots are mailed out. Um, we try to uh, have it open during business hours. It does get locked at the end of the day. But if we are here on the weekends, which I anticipate we will be here for the next couple of weekends, we'll, we'll open it up while we're in the office and you know, folks will be able to drop off their ballot using the, the, um, the front uh, box in front of City Hall. So it's right at the bottom of the steps. I did make these business cards. I think I, I mean, um, yeah, these little tiny business cards for folks. Um, I gave some to the city councilors to sort of hand out to some of their constituents. We do have more in the office if you feel like you're going to an event and this might be something that you want to uh, make available to residents. And on the front side, it tells uh, the date, for example, of the last day to register to vote or how to make changes to um, your mm -hmm. voter request. If you have questions, how to reach us. And on the back side, it has all of the hours that we have planned for early voting. This year, we are adding Sundays to our early voting hours. Uh, I think it, um, in the past, we've only had them on Saturdays, but I think the Sundays will be a good addition because I anticipate there will be a lot more people coming to early vote in person at City Hall, and we wanted to make sure that we had uh, time available for those folks who um, needed a Sunday to come and visit us. So. Um, on Sunday, October 20th, we're here from 10 to 2. And on Sunday, October 27th, again, we'll be here from 10 to 2. So, and the previous Saturday as well for both of those weeks. 
Thank you. Any other questions? Um, would, is the council interested in suspending the rules and voting on this tonight? It's hard to see how we would make a change to this over the next couple of weeks. Move to suspend the rules. Second. Okay. A uh, motion made by Councillor Elkins and seconded by Councillor Clemmer to suspend the rule that would allow us to vote on this tonight. Any discussion on suspension of rule? Okay. Roll call, please. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. Councillor Moulton. Yes. Councillor Perry. Yes. Councillor Rothenberg. Yes. Councillor Dobbs. Yes. Councillor Elkins. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. And Councillor Clemmer. Yes. Okay, motion to suspend the rules passes unanimously. Is there a motion to approve? Move to approve. Oh. Mm -hmm. uh, motion Second. made by Councillor Labarge. Because of the time delay, she probably started first. <laughs> uh, seconded by Councillor Perry. Always a bridesmaid. Any further discussion? <laughs> Okay, uh, roll call please on approval of um, the warrant for the election. Councillor Maori. Yes. Councillor Mould. Yes. Councillor Perry. Yes. Councillor Rothenberg. Yes. Councillor Dobbs. Yes. Councillor Elkins. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Clemmer. Yes. And Councillor Labarge. Yes. Okay, that passes unanimously. We will have an election. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you, Clerk Powers. Okay, take care. Uh, that next brings us to zoning ordinances that have not yet been referred. Uh, 24.152, an ordinance to rezone eight general industrial and three office industrial parcels in Florence. This is in first reading, and um, we are required to refer zoning ordinances to the Planning Board and the Committee on Legislative Matters. <coughs> uh, and I believe that Carolyn Mish, yes, and is, is here, Director Mish, and <coughs> is a co-host. Um, so um, I am a co-sponsor of this ordinance along with the <coughs> Mayor and the Office of Planning and Sustainability, so I'm happy to uh, speak to it briefly, and then if there's any questions uh, for the director or, or myself, I'd be happy to entertain them. Um, but we will have a public hearing for, um, to really dive into it. So this, the goal of these changes is to bring their existing residential parcels that are currently uh, zoned either general industrial or office industrial, um, and to bring those into the district that aligns with their current use. So, you know, for example, sometimes someone lives in a house that's always been a house, that it's in this industrial zone. In order to do something like add a second unit, they have to go to the Zoning Board of Appeals or because it's, it's um, not actually allowed under the industrial zoning, even though it's a, it's a residential use. Um, and the other use is to provide more opportunities for redevelopment for the industrial and commercial properties. So there's several properties in the general industrial district um, that if they're moved to office industrial, it would allow residential uses above the first floor. So that housing uh, could be built in those districts um, while still permitting all the other uses of office <coughs> industrial. Um, the difference between general industrial and office industrial in terms of what it limits, there's, there's just a couple things, mainly warehousing uh, would not be allowed in office industrial. So think like an Amazon warehouse, for example. Um, need, none of these places are appropriate for that, uh, something like the industrial park would be. Um, <coughs> Uh, so, and that one of these parcels is uh, currently owned by Bichem, the former chemical plant, uh, 238 Nonatuck Street, and they are interested in, in redevelopment, including housing. Um, so that is the summary. Um, we've reached out to all the affected property owners, had conversations with several of them. And October 24th would be the likely public hearing. So questions for me or uh, Director Mish? Okay. 
Okay, and entertain a motion to refer to the planning board and legislative matters. So moved. Second. Okay, motion made by Councillor Elkins and seconded by Councillor Perry. Any discussion on referral? <coughs> uh, roll call, please, on referral. Councillor Mol Moulton. Yes. Councillor Perry. Yes. Councillor Rothenberg. Abstain. Councillor Dobbs. Yes. Councillor Elkins. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Clemmer. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. And Councillor Maori. Yes. That passes with eight yes votes and one abstention. And uh, we'll, the Legislative Matters Chair, I'm sure, will be in touch to let us know when that is scheduled. Okay, next is uh, ordinances in second reading, 24.137, an ordinance to amend Schedule 9, off-street parking areas to add 33 King Street. <coughs> So this received a positive recommendation in legislative matters yesterday. Um, and um, well, we have Director Mish still with us. If, if there are questions, um, would the chair of legislative matters like to speak to this? Um, I would just say, so we, it was a brief discussion, but it came back with a positive recommendation. Um, this is um, those folks who are listening, the, the parking lot behind the old um, family and probate court building. Um, and basically what's being proposed is to um, have the city to have a little uh, ability to um, charge for parking in that lot. Um, it's being used for parking. Um, city's maintaining it has actually, I think, had <coughs> improvements on it because it became a, cr a crater, a cratered, <laughs> uh, 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 a very a very rough place to park um, and that's been fixed so um, so this for folks who um, are familiar with this property we have this was a it was a former court building we have an arrangement um, with the state um, basically to split the proceeds of us any sale um, that uh, goes through of that to a, you know, to a private um, you know out of government hands and the faster we sell it the little bit more we get from it but um in the meantime people are using it for parking and so we're putting it aside um to charge um and it'll be the rates of the outlying you know the more outlying parking so yep 50 50 cents per hour from 10 a.m to 8 p.m and again it's only until the lot is actually sold right at that point in time who, whoever buys it you know will be able to make decisions about what they do with it, um, but it won't be the city's anymore. So we approve that with a positive recommendation, and so that's that. Okay. Any questions? Yes, Councillor Rothenberg, and then we'll go to Councillor Moulton. What happens when people park there now? Is it just sort of a Wild West situation? That's exactly how Director Mish uh, described it. Uh, when, we, when, when we first she said, it's the Wild West. So no, it's, it's free right now. Mm -hmm. And, and it's allowable right now. There's no penalty to anyone for parking there for free, as far as we know. As far as, yeah. Okay. Yeah, even, oh, I'm sorry. Even when it was uh, still a court, it, after hours, they would raise the gates and let the public park in there. Um, so. Councilor Moulton. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, this is a question for uh, Director Mish. Because of the, um, the arrangement, the city will split uh, proceeds from the actual sale of the property with the state. Do you think that the state might want to split the proceeds from parking uh, while the sale awaits? Um, um, meaning as um, counselors, um, and to answer your question, Councilor Moulton, um, we don't know for sure, but we're supposed to give quarterly reports to the Commonwealth um, on our expenses. And so at the end of the period to when a sale goes through, that's when all the accounting will sort of come forward about um, how much the city expended and how much, um, you know, would be deducted. So I think it would be determined at that time that um, this might end up being a wash for some of the expenses that we've already put into the parking lot. but. Um, I guess the, the short answer is that 
um, all of our expenses and any revenue that we come in will sort of come into the accounting uh, at the time that we uh, have an ultimate buyer and sell the property. Okay, thanks. Councilor Perry. Yes, so I was at the Legislative Matters meeting and I moved to move this positively, but I, I do want to state the Wild West situation was nice. A lot of my fellow service industry folks have been using that lot for a while. Uh, you know, there's, there's a need for later night parking, and so that has really been a, a great space. And uh, what, what pushed me towards positive was knowing that the city invested some, some money in towards making it <laughs> not so full of craters and hazardous to people's cars. So if we're uh, trying to just get back a little bit of that money, I'm uh, fine with that. But it would be nice to have some more spaces for our service industry folks to park at a rate that is not, uh, you know, the same as the main street. Uh, with that said, I will move to uh, move this f uh, forward with a positive recommendation and approve. You mean approve? I move to, to approve, approve it. Yeah, yeah. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Motion made by Councillor Perry and seconded by Councillor Elkins. Further discussion, Councillor Rothenberg. Yeah, I think for Ward 3, I'll vote no, just because we're leaning towards, we would like free parking generally. And I think we all received a really nice email today from someone who comes to shop in Northampton. And it's just noting, you know, like as you compete with other cities whose downtowns are cropping up, parking is one of the ways that we can be more competitive. So we, I would encourage and welcome a bigger discussion and initiative on parking down the line. Any other discussion? Okay. Um, <clears throat> roll call, please, on approval. Councillor Perry. Yes. Councillor Rothenberg. No. Councillor Dubbs. Mm, abstain. Councillor Elkins. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Clemmer. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. And Councillor Moulton. Yes. Okay, that passes with seven yes votes, one no, and one abstention. Um, brings us to 24.135, an ordinance relative to housekeeping changes to the zoning ordinance. This is in second reading. Um, it received a positive recommendation with three small changes, which are redlined and highlighted in, uh, on the agenda from the planning board. And then it received a positive recommendation from Legislative Matters with uh, several edits which are reflected in what's on the agenda and also listed here. Um, so Director Mish is, is here to speak to this if we would like. Um, we have you know, gone in, in detail in both the Planning Board and Legislative Matters and it, are there uh, is there any counselor who has questions or would like an explanation of any part of this? Okay, seeing none, I'd entertain a motion to approve. Move to approve. Is that the two of you? That was. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah. So, motion made by Councillor Elkins and seconded by Councillor Mayori. Uh, further discussion on these housekeeping changes. Uh, I will just add that one of the things I appreciate about them is the more inclusive definition of a family. Um, I've certainly lived in, in houses at times and units at times where I would not have been considered a family um, just based on the, the, the number of folks and the, the relationships. So um, I appreciate this, this change. I agree, that is a good change. I would throw in my concurrence as well. I uh, had a uh, group touring from Tennessee last night at the Iron Horse who I took a brief break to go to our meeting and I told them about the, the changes to the family and they were so awestruck at how awesome our city was. So uh, yeah. they will continue on the road. They were on their way to Montreal to spread the good word of how great Northampton is. <laughs> so thank you. Excellent. Like image. Thanks. Um, okay, well, I think we're ready then for a roll call for approval. Councillor Rothenberg. Abstain. Councillor Dubbs. Yes. Councillor Elkins. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Clemmer. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. Councillor Moulton. Yes. 
Councillor Perry. Yes. Okay, that passes with eight yes votes and one abstention. Okay, we have a call for a recess from Councillor Maori. Um, what's come back at 8.45, nine minutes.
Welcome back to the Northampton City Council. And next on our agenda, resolutions. Uh, the first one, 24.153, a resolution in support of Massachusetts State Ballot Question 4 to decriminalize natural psychedelics for therapeutic use um, in first reading and sponsored by Councilors Mayori and Dubs. Uh, would you like to read the resolution? Yeah, okay. Yeah, you, yeah, you, you do the honors. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, this is a resolution in support of Massachusetts State Ballot Question 4 to decriminalize natural psychedelics for therapeutic use. Be it resolved by the City Council of the City of Northampton in City Council, assembled as follows. Whereas nearly one in three Massachusetts adults struggle with mental health challenges and... Whereas pioneering research from respected institutions such as John Hopkins University and Dana-Farber Cancer Institute finds that natural psychedelics can be effective in managing treatment-resistant depression and other forms of mental illness and... Whereas the FDA recently granted psilocybin, one of the psychedelics, breakthrough therapy designation for treatment-resistant depression, depression and major depressive disorder, and... Whereas natural psychedelics have been found to treat severe forms of mental illness, including PTSD, OCD, anxiety, depression, end-of-life distress, and some forms of addiction, and... Whereas the Northampton City Council unanimously passed our... 21.207, a resolution decriminalizing controlled substance possession as well as cultivation and distribution of psychedelic plants, which supports the decriminalizing and regulation of psychedelic plants for therapeutic purposes and... Whereas ballot question four would decriminalize five naturally occurring psychedelic substances in the Commonwealth and... Whereas the ballot question would create a regulated framework for psychedelic assisted therapy for adults 21 and older, similar to ballots passed in Colorado in 2022 and Oregon in, in 2020. Therefore, be it resolved that the City Council of Northampton supports passage of ballot question four on the November 5th, 2024 election ballot and urges Massachusetts voters to vote yes on four and... Therefore, be it resolved that the administrative assistant to the city council shall send a copy of this resolution to state representative Lindsay Sabadosa and state senator Joe Comerford, Northwestern District Attorney David E. Sullivan, Northampton Police Chief John Cartledge, Northampton Director of Veteran Services Steve Connor, Massachusetts Secretary of Veteran Services John Santiago, and the Massachusetts Board of Res Registration of Allied Mental Health and Human Services Professions. Thank you. Would the sponsors like to speak to their resolution? Um, sure, I'll start and just um, want to thank Councilor Mayori for um, asking me to be a part of this resolution. Um, I think um, you know it's it's really important to, to for for uh, just a very simple one simple reason to support this resolution is that I think it's it's important to um, educate people on this topic. Um, I've already had people reach out to me that aren't sure how they feel about this uh, ballot question um, and feel like they don't know enough about it in order to come up with their own decision about it. And so I feel like um, it's it's good to provide this information and sort of um, be a guide as a council to to uh, a guide to people to um, to sort of help them come up with their own educated decision on on on, uh, on this ballot question. Um, so, yeah, I'm happy to support it, and and I'll give the rest of the time to Council Maiori. All right. Well, thank you. That was well said. And, um, yeah, I feel passionately about uh, on this issue, and I do think what you said is true, that it's not, um, it's not so clear to some people, and, and so it might need some amplification. We had really, um, really interesting conversations Military veterans are very much behind uh, this, this ballot initiative uh, as organizations uh, because of its remarkable data and promising data around PTSD. 
Um, I, I, I just want to say that I, we wanted to introduce it tonight. That there's someone from the campaign, yes, on four, who can join us for the 17th, so we can have a bigger discussion. So I'm not shutting anyone down, but we are. I just want to warn you that we're going to be talking about it again at you know at, at the time when they can join us, uh, and and perhaps answer you know any detailed questions. Just broad strokes, though. This is not recreational use. This isn't recreational stores. This is regulated therapy, assisted therapy you know mandated you know kind of um, type of use of psychedelics and it's um, I think it's I don't I don't see really why we wouldn't want to give tools to those suffering especially at this level you know give all the tools possible and that the I the the data around addiction is really interesting especially alcoholism that it's not addictive and in fact really can help with addiction so I, I'm kind of um heartened by that that's a tough it's a really it's a tough thing to treat so uh i don't i think that i won't say more and because because i think we'll have someone here in fact i think they're even having a press conference in northampton that day rep sabadosa is also working actively particularly on this campaign and i've talked to her about it and you know she really thinks it's a do or die moment for this type of initiative here thank you counselors Well, I, I really appreciate uh, you bringing this. I'm looking forward to learning more about it over the next couple of weeks and, and learning more uh, on uh, the, the 17th. All right, that's our next meeting. Any other uh, comments before we move on and, and we'll take this up then? Okay. We will move then to our last resolution. 24.145, a resolution in support of Mass Promise to Invest, equitable public school funding for every child. This is in second reading. Uh, we had, it uh, was introduced and discussed um, on the 19th of September. And um, I, uh, um, there, there's been, there have been a couple of edits. Um, so uh, thanks. I appreciate those those updates that you've made, and I think it's a stronger resolution. Um, and so sponsored by Councilors Dubs, Rothenberg, and Labarge. And um, you know, Councilor Rothenberg, you you weren't here the first time, so I'm glad you have an opportunity to speak to this. Uh, would would any of the sponsors like to speak first? No, nope. I said what I had to say. And I said okay, thank you, Councilor Labarge. So I think, you know, this is really, <clears throat> this is just sort of a first volley or skirmish to try to really attract um, a bill, a sponsor of a bill. And we're sort of holding ourselves out as one example, but of course, we're many cities dealing with this. And this is something we've talked about as a city for a while. This is something Narkowitz would talk about as well. Um, what this what this asks for is basically the difference between our expenses and what we're reimbursed. So we're spending between the school choice and the charter three point six million dollars. We get point six back. And so we're saying, you know, we'd like three million dollars and we'd like you to do that by changing the formula um, for both of those items. So even though it's, you know, listing a specific dollar amount here, it's really just using that as an example to talk about the underlying formula problem. And, you know, you can sort of read the, 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 the real ripple, ripple effects of this. I think it's laid out really nicely here by the resident co-sponsors that really drafted this, but it is really a vicious cycle of imposing a burden on a public system that can then not invest enough in its schools, potentially, or is sending its money to other schools that then are attracting students, right? And then we have less coming to our schools and less interest in our schools and all of these things. It just sort of goes on and on and on. But I think, I think really the big thing here is that this was an experiment and there should be a time and this should be the time to think about whether or not the funding is working. And if the state really likes this model, and if the residents across the state like this model, then it's time to figure out the permanent funding source. Um, and it, it really is not, not making a lot of sense 
to have these individual cities bearing the cost of students being shuffled all over the place. Um, so if we want to make this permanent, it really needs to, the charter school that is, that really needs to be supported by the state. And then, you know, the chapter 70 aid being stagnant for 20 years is just, it speaks for itself. Mm -hmm. So I really hope that we will support this and that we will use this in an attempt to get our state legislators, legislators interested in this. Mm, I hope that we're all on the same page. I wasn't here for the discussion. So last week, I don't know if anyone is opposed or has any questions, but Thank you. Uh, Councillor Mayori. Yeah. I'm, Your microphone. Oh, thank you. So I, I would, yeah, I, I appreciate the innovation here. I, I Thank you for bringing this forward. I think it, it totally makes sense. What I really like is the clarity. I don't appreciate the obfuscation and just the formula itself. Yeah. I mean, it's very difficult for people to even figure it out. It, um, so this is great. I'm going to support this uh, either way, but my suggestion, I mean, resolutions are supposed to be kind of this eternal document. So I don't know if we want to say $3 million, you know, and this year or something, because, you know, 10 years from now, <laughs> 3 million might not be enough. Um, but I will, that I'll leave that up to the sponsors. It's a friendly suggestion. I'm going to uh, support this and I, I appreciate it being brought forth. I, this is great. This is ground up stuff. When 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 governments aren't doing what you need them to do, this is the kind of ground up uh, legwork that can get things done. So thank you. Just respond. Yeah. Yeah. So sort of what I was trying to open with. It's it's really not perfect in that eternal way. And I think that in this case, it is still the simplest way to illustrate what we're looking for. And I think we should, I think the bill itself that will hopefully come out of this will look very different. Mm -hmm. um, I agree with you that it would, it would be better if there were a real specific way to just say, hey, we're looking for a hundred percent of this cost. But I, I think this is really sort of just an example. Um, this is this year, this is what would work. We'll have it be this way annually and it may change annually. And then in the first now, therefore, be it resolved, you have the line that says, give us the $3 million annually by changing the funding formula for school choice tuition and charter school tuition. So I think there is a dichotomy there. I don't know if any of my co-sponsors want to recommend a change, but I do think in a way it's not so much permanent as it is temporary. I think we're really just trying to get a bill moving. I, I yeah. defer to the yeah, I, I actually, what's nice is that it is clear <laughs> that it isn't <laughs> countering it with another formula. So there ha has that going for it, and I defer to the, the sponsors. Other counselors? Questions? Um, well, I'll just say that... Um, you know, this this is a, such an important contribution to the advocacy that's needed to fix the Chapter 70 funding formula. Um, you know, Councillor uh, Elkins and Perry and um, Moulton and I wrote a letter this summer that uh, really laid out uh, the effects that this that this has had and, and the change that's needed. There's a bunch of different ways it could happen that would work. This could be one of them. Um, so um, the important thing is change that formula, make it work for the for all communities across the state. Exactly. Yep. I move to approve. Okay, seconded. Motion made by Councillor Elkins and seconded by Councillor Perry to approve. Any further discussion? Seeing none, roll call, please. Job. Yes. Elkins. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Clever. Yes. Councillor Labard. Yes. Councillor Mayori. Yes. Councillor Morton. Yes. Councillor Perry. Yes. Councillor Rosenberg. Yes. Okay, that passes unanimously. And that's the end of our agenda. Is there a motion to adjourn? I move to adjourn. Adjourn. <laughs> I move to adjourn. Okay. <laughs> um, and was there a second? Second. Okay. 
Motion made by Councillor Perry and seconded by Councillor Elkins. Sure. Roll call, please. Councillor Elkins. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Clemmer. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Oh, yes. <laughs> Councillor Mayori. Oh. Yes. Councillor Moulton. Yes. Councillor Perry. Yes. Councillor Rothenberg. Yes. Councillor Dobbs. Uh, no, I think I want to stay, actually. Uh, oh, no. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yes. Okay. 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 We are adjourned.